September 7, 2017 meeting of the Scarborough Ordinance Committee. And we'll come to order. Uh, uh, Councilor St. Clair uh, has uh, some sick children, cannot make it today. Councilor uh, Foley is sitting in, in her place. Councilor Roman here, and I'm Councilor Donovan. Uh, approval of minutes. I have a motion. Uh, move approval. Second. Uh, any changes, edits? All in favor? Uh, discussion of public parking lot passes. Uh, we have, uh, at the last meeting, received from uh, Todd Souza the uh, outline of uh, payments that are presently being called for by a half dozen towns. Uh, they range from 100 to $200. Old Orchard Beach is sort of right in the middle at $150. Some towns restrict the number of out-of-town passes, others do not. Uh, so we're kind of the low man on the totem pole. Uh, and uh, uh, in light of uh, uh, free parking for those with parking passes, whether it's an in-town parking uh, a Scarborough resident or a non-Scarborough resident for parking in the meter system now installed at Higgins uh, Beach, uh, I think it'd be appropriate. And the reason for this being on the agenda is to uh, see if we can establish an appropriate fee for out of town uh, uh, parking passes, seasonal parking passes. So, what are your thoughts? So, uh, my my thought is, I agree that I think we're um, under where we need to be um, from a just from a, a fairness standpoint. The difference being thirty five dollars for resident and non resident mm -hmm. um, being a concern. Um, I think I, I also I looked at some of the other ones that were highlighted here. At, um, I guess I'd like to also say I feel like the I don't know how long we've had our daily parking fee where it is, but um, I, I feel like maybe that is something we could mm -hmm. uh, consider bringing up. Um, and then when you look at the boat launch fees, um, it, uh, it you know we're way above um, for the resident boat launch, boat launch fee. Um, of the other towns that even charge fees, some people, some towns don't even charge fees. So I wonder if if there wouldn't be like a balancing mm -hmm. there. Uh, let's ask the town manager. If, mm -hmm. uh, are you familiar with the history of the seventy-five dollar seasonal parking pass charge? In terms of how long it's been that, mm -hmm. I don't believe it's changed during my tenure. I can speak to that. So that's so nine years. Back to the mid. Yeah, and beyond, it, it may be earlier. I could certainly research that. It would have been a change to the fee schedule, so we can document when that would have occurred. Do you know about the daily, the daily fee? Same. I believe it's the same. I, I'm, again, I'm not aware. It's not changed during my tenure. Yeah. Um, and I think specifically around the uh, the daily fee, I, I think I'd be interested in in raising the non-resident daily fee um, mm -hmm. again from an, it, a fairness issue. Yeah, that's a, uh, uh, I've always been bothered by the daily fee because I thought to charge $10 to get into any of our parking lots when you might only be there for an hour versus being there for a full beach day, four or five hours, mm -hmm. three, four hours, uh, just seemed inequitable. Uh, but now what we have is uh, community services has in its budget a park and pay station or a gate station, and I don't think they've selected which one they want to go with, materially different cost structures for mm. the two, uh, that will be based on an hourly fee, So, which I think is great. I, th I think that allows people to not be put off by what is limited parking. There's, you know, if you go to Ferry Beach, there's no place to park except at Ferry Beach. All of the parking on all the streets of Prouts Neck are no parking. Uh, so uh, that that just seems 
you have to pay the ten dollars, and I think that's inequitable. And that lot fills up. Yeah, go so, ahead. Good. And your thoughts? Yeah. So I, well, I agree a lot with what Councilor Rowan already said. I do think there's an opportunity here for some increased revenue that we're perhaps missing. Um, I would like to see it be, you know, as, as equitable as possible. My question was really around that gate system. So, uh, if it were to move to an hourly piece, would it be like, okay, so it's ten dollars to get in the gate, and then hourly after that, or uh, how do you envision that? I think he's just going to charge by the hour. Okay. So. And and I I think that's. Do we have an estimate of an idea of what what are we thinking of per hour? Because I'm thinking if I go to the beach for four hours and I only pay $2 an hour, now I'm paying less than I would have, which we would lose money instead of gain money. Right. Uh, and I don't want us to do that. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, the lots do fill up, though. I mean, I feel other than, uh, you know, herd park doesn't fill up. As but we'll also be able to gain revenue that we're now losing. We don't have attendance show up till 9, and we've heard and we've all witnessed sometimes on a high each day that lot is full before the attendants even show up. Right. Yep. So I, I appreciate your point. Uh, we will probably lose on some, but the hope is that we'll pick up others to, to balance it out. It's also not a significant source of revenue. I look at it more as just an equity issue. Where so yeah. it is 6 a.m. in the lot too at Higgins then? Um, the, the, it's, it's dawn to, to dusk, so there are folks, particularly fishermen and I think some surfers and maybe dog walkers, but I don't think there are, there are actual beachgoers that are there in those early morning hours. No, by nine though, it does fill up. No. Mm -hmm. But yeah. you know, and it's, you can probably count them on two hands the number of days where the weather's good um, and it fills up early in the morning before our crew's there. So it's not a rampant problem, but mm -hmm. there's money being lost. But for I sure. do think your question's a good one that we should we should find out uh, whether uh, and at least weigh in. It's obviously uh, going to be t Tom. Would that be on a fee schedule? Sure. If, uh, that will have to come to the council and be approved as, okay. as part so of your Okay. So I think we could probably consult with Absolutely. the community services director on that. Because I could almost see it working like there's a minimum amount just to get in the gate, right? So if I yeah. am a dog walker or a fisherman or whomever and I just want to use it for that quick hour in the morning, then I shouldn't pay any more than I would pay in a one-hour spot. But if I'm going to try to cheat the system and yeah. be parking there all day, so if I paid, let's say, and I'm just throwing this out there, let's say I pay five dollars to get in, but I stay for ten hours, right. I could end up paying twenty-five by or thirty by the end of the day, and I think that is also fair, <laughs> um, depending on where but we. I, the I system know. you'll be able to set it up anyway. Like you could have first hour is one number and additional hours is maybe a lesser number? I would love to mm. see, I mean, if there was a way to do that, I would love to see us keep those early mm. morning hours, um, although a lot of those people will have beach passes to the other point, which... Right, uh, which is especially keeping the beach pass, uh, I agree with your comment about the beach pass for in town should continue to be attractive. Uh, I wouldn't actually favor increasing that at all. No. Whereas I would take the beach pass for uh, out of town and probably just find some sweet spot in the middle of what is the range of payments between 100 and 200 with Old Orchard Beach at 150. I'd say put it at 150 and let it sit there for 10 years at 150. We don't have to change it again. Uh, uh, it's probably an appropriate, uh, uh, appropriate amount right in the middle of what people charge. Uh, I would like to know more about what um, what Todd is yeah. planning uh, because you're raising some good points. Often lots are uh, charging first hour. Well, if you're in a metropolitan area, the first hour is like ten or fifteen dollars, right. and then the next half hour or hour is five dollars, three dollars, and goes down. So that. Mm. On the, on the other hand, I, uh, I always had thought in terms of two or three bucks an hour, and you get up to ten dollars eventually, but you wouldn't be, and, and the reason that it works from a finance point of view is now you've really encouraged people to come uh, uh, instead of paying ten dollars, they'll pay two or three dollars or four dollars. 
And for a beach like Higgins, that can be very important depending on the tide. Uh, that beach clears out at high tide. So uh, whereas Pine Point, it's tide, yeah, it does. you know, you, you can still stay on the beach even at high tide. But I can see how this discussion and the whole structure, uh, and I don't want to rush uh, Todd into a decision on that. Maybe what we could do is just put this, hold this over uh, and carry on the discussion. You want to deal with, with it all at once? With Todd. Okay. And, and actually, I think if you wanted to check with him to see what his timetable was. Oh, he's in process. He's, he's inquired on a couple of occasions, in my he, thoughts. So I think he's, if he he'd like to bring to, a proposal for you to react to. That would be good. And if it's the next okay. meeting, and great. I, and I think he was also, if I remember correctly, he was looking at the, what the state beach passes were. I think, that's I think he added that. Yeah. Did he, I, did he I, add that? Yeah. Okay. It's at I the bottom. Did he? Yep. It's right here. So State okay. of Maine Season Park Pass, $105. Uh, Scarborough Beach Daily Beach Fee, $6 resident adult, $8 non-resident adult, $4 resident youth, $5 non-resident youth. Scarborough Beach is that? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that would be Scarborough Crescent, like if you were doing local. Yeah. Well, good. You want to leave it right there that we'll uh, ask Todd to give us uh, his ideas about how to structure a program uh, and we'll uh, yeah the, I think the issues that are hanging him up right now um, he may not have even gone through the whole fee consideration yet but uh, is really kind of the logistics of how you manage the gates and in and out do you pay before you go in do you pay on the way out and part of the challenge with Higgins in particular which is where we're going to test this is that uh, there's only space for about three cars um, once you turn off Ocean Avenue, a stack. Uh, if there's a gate that stops you, and um, we just want to be very thoughtful about how we're going to manage flow in and out, and yeah. where, at what point are we going to take payment? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. We'll we'll leave it there for the moment. Um, the next item on the agenda uh, is the discussion of noise special amusement licenses and the applicability of the good neighbor policy. Uh, Katie uh, provided us with, uh, I thought, uh, a good email from a uh, constituent. Uh, have you had discussions that you could share with us uh, uh, about the, uh, the noise issue in primarily at Pine Point? Yeah, I mean, this, that particular uh, constituent's concern was directly related to his home. Um, but I, and I kind of brought it to the ordinance committee more as a, a general thoughtfulness around as things continue to kind of evolve and change, particularly down at Pine Point where we now have four different, four or five different establishments that, you know, may have live music or may desire to have live music and uh, where they're set in such a residential setting. How does that play against it? So um, he had reached out to me, asked me to come down to his house on a Saturday night, which I did, and um, I will tell you, I was sitting in his living room with the windows and doors shut, and the windows were rattling yeah. from the noise. Um, and, you know, the remark that evening was, this is actually a really good band, so I don't mind it so much, but there are other times when there's a, a different band that is not so enjoyable. Um, so I think the concern is legitimate. Um, and I, so I started to look at, and the hard part for me, again, is that how to generalize this, because I think it could be an, an issue or applicable to other places. Um, in that particular person's case, it's exactly where they're located. It, it's, it affects probably that circle. Because of where the uh, music is originating from and being projected to. Mm -hmm. And specifically referring to the amphitheater at theater at Bailey's down to the neighborhood that's in behind. Correct. Yeah. So like if you have, if you live here, and this is uh, actually the person, the other neighbor that I spoke with that mm -hmm. knew you, um, they cannot in the summertime sit on their back deck and have a conversation. Mm -hmm. It's too loud. Did you get a sense, uh, as I thought about his email, uh, whether this is a new phenomenon or whether this is a decades old Phenomenon. That band show's been there a while, so at least they probably have been living with this and have just it's gotten to the point where it's 
It's really bothersome. I got the impression from the, from the email that they had been, it has been going on for a while and they had given up. Uh, the, the prior neighbors have complained before and gotten nothing, nothing accomplished. That was, we have, that was my impression as well. Whereas we have three other more recent experiences further down on Pine Point, um, which are kind of new establishments, uh, much newer phenomena. And go over those for us just so that the... Well, the three establishments are the garage... Um, Conroy's. Yeah, okay. Old Conroy's Garage, uh, Salty Bay. I believe this year, this summer was the first year. Mm -hmm. And then Bailey's Seafood as well out on the pier. And I think they've done that for two seasons now. And the one that we've received the most concern about is the Salty Bay experience. The others seem to be either acoustic or time such that um, it's not bothersome to the neighbors. Um, I know with the, uh, the bait shed, they close at dusk. Um, so it doesn't run late into the evening anyway. And I haven't heard anything about the garage. I have not specifically. It's a little busier heard. area. It's more it's not commercial exclusively. There's certainly residential around there, but it's a different feel of that area of the neighborhood, I think. Hmm. And I didn't pull the zoning for each of those, but they, my guess is they're, the, what's the allowed use is different, right? No, so what's interesting about this is that when you look at the Bailey's property, uh, it starts in R2, and then the back end of it is RF. And where I think the band shell is actually placed is RF, which is probably, I mean, it's, I think if it were <laughs> placed at the back of the campground where there's no houses, it probably wouldn't be a problem. It's just the location. Hmm. Yeah, it's located up right at the head of the, you know, where the little, uh, there's a swimming pool. It's kind of a concentration of entertainment activities of the uh, yeah, ground. Anybody who deals with this sort of uh, uh, fights the, the, on the one hand, has it been there a long time and, and it's been allowed to exist and there's an expectation. On the other hand, we've had a uh, ordinance on the books. This noise ordinance was not new. That, that was the, been on the books for quite some time and had never been perceived as applicable to supersede uh, a, an amusement permit, mm -hmm. or at least it, it, it seems as if. No, in fact, we've got a, a very recent ruling on that regard, in that regard from the town attorney that, um, that just by virtue of being issued a valid entertainment special amusement uh, license doesn't um, does not supersede. Does not supersede the good neighbor right. ordinance. Because still there is no exemption in it to right. say it supersedes, I think is what Attorney Tatsu coming back and saying right. it's it's on the books, uh, therefore it's enforceable unless there's some provision of law in the ordinances that says it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, and obviously the campground situation, it, uh, and I distributed just for the audience. I d did distribute the applicable noise ordinance to all the uh, ordinance committee members, and it says that uh, in the daytime, which is a defined term in the ordinance, it's within 200 music, amplified music, is within 200 feet of the source of the music, I think. And at nighttime, again a defined term, uh, it's not to be heard outside the building in which it occurs. So obviously, the circumstances that are being described by counselors today, which they've observed, uh, uh, further than 200 feet. Yeah, I mean they clearly are violating these conditions, and we have an opinion from the uh, council, our council, our attorney, that that provision is applicable. Uh, and as I thought about this today, just sort of getting ready, I was saying uh, maybe one thing we need to do is have our process identify noise more clearly in the application process, have a uh, review and recommendation, because these permits all come to the town council for approval, uh, but... Do they all come to the town council, or is it only when they have to be renewed that they, or excuse me, uh, when they go out? Because last night we had one that 
That was for food handlers. That was I'll for check food handlers because it was outside. Whether, uh, so renewals. And we did that for efficiency of council because oh, no there used to be a ton of them on your agenda. You can reverse that decision if you wish to see them all. Um, I, I, I tend to agree with the, the chairman here that um, I think the better approach is to add some additional requirements um, to the special amusement application um, to include maybe even notice to abutters so people are aware that this is being considered. You're likely to get the best input from those that are being most directly affected. Yeah. And uh, I know this council and any future council will be very receptive to hear to pe from people that have firsthand experience. Uh, and I also think on the application to, to make reference to, as to your point, to make reference to the noise ordinance. Exactly. I mean, it, if it is the intention of the town of council are. at this point in time to have that ordinance be applicable, it's on the books, and our attorney says it is applicable. But now, since it's never been enforced, uh, we need to make a judgment. Do we want to make it applicable? And if we do, I would think the application form would actually have on it, because I think the application then gets an approval at the bottom. Sure. Uh, yep, we will uh, find it. Would actually note that you are either exempted from the noise ordinance or you're not. And the provision of the noise ordinance could be part of the paperwork that an applicant receives. Yeah, I would recommend that you don't exempt someone from the ordinance. Rather, there will be certain cases, and Bailey's campground may be a good example of giving existing st structure that's open, that is where it is, unless they relocate it, uh, that's not going to change. So you're setting, it by issuing a license of any sort, you either have to exempt them from it, or you knowingly will be allowing a violation. The other option is to impose conditions that say, exactly. okay, we'll let you violate in these sorts of ways. Maybe it's a time allowance, maybe it's days of the week. And I don't know what those and conditions and would be. And when I said exemption, what I mean is it will not be applicable because we are going to recite conditions uh, uh, yeah. for the approval. I thought you meant a blanket exemption. No, no, okay. that, that it would be superseded by specific, because the Bailey's campground may be a situation where there is an equitable argument for allowing them to continue to do what they've done for a long time. Uh, but it's clear that it can't intrude on the neighborhood to the extent yeah. that has been described. Yeah. And well, and I'd also, I would advocate that, you know, I mean, I didn't reach out to anyone at Bailey's to talk with them, and the neighbors were all very clear in that they, you know, they, they don't think they're bad neighbors yes. necessarily, mm -hmm. and they were hesitant to even continue, but it has been going on for a long time. They feel like they have not been heard, and, um, but if we could so somehow bring those, bring bring them here to also hear how this would impact their business. Exactly. I just think there has to be an equitable outcome for situations that have existed for a long time, right. uh, but which are clearly a nuisance. There may even be a compromise we can strike that we haven't thought of yet. Yeah. So I have been to an event at uh, at Bailey's in the clamshell where there was music playing, and I can tell you it was cranked up really loudly such that I was uncomfortable and maybe that's just me, but I was uncomfortable being in the building while the music was playing because I couldn't, couldn't converse with anyone. It was, it was so loud. And so maybe at there's a way that they could turn at, it down a little bit. At the campground? At the campground. In yeah. that amphitheater? In, in the, in the amphitheater. Yeah, because they've held yeah. Scarborough Education uh, Association events there, which yeah. I've attended, and, and I could tell. I didn't see where it was dark, so I didn't see where the neighbors were. Right. But it was loud. Uh, Clearly, you could have heard it many more than 200 feet away. Well, yeah, and what Certainly. was interesting, so I drove up and down the road to to kind of see at what point. And it definitely, once I got, I'd say, beyond here, it, it, because the clamshell kind of hones it in, yep. you couldn't hear it anymore. It, it was amazing. It. I mean, what was so mm -hmm. loud, like I thought I was at a concert right there, yeah. just 100 feet down the road, couldn't. Here. Yeah, and the people in the path of that projection are most directly affected, I'm sure. So I don't know so if there's something so that let, could be let, done there. Let's too. take them in, in, in order. Process-wise, I would think we would want to ask the town manager, the assistant town manager, to uh, uh, recommend some amendments 
to the uh, form that we use to try to capture information about noise, outdoor noise, because most of these amusement permits are not going to involve any outdoor noise. So that, but but for those that do, and we've identified, I guess, four that we know of, we we need to have that be identified right up front. Uh, yeah, we could collect some generic information, details of the proposed entertainment, whether it's to be inside or outside, whether right. they have any, from their own business perspective, any time limits as to when it begins and ends. And, and seems like, it seems like Larissa um, indicated she might have a comment. Well, I have a question. So, just the outside one, certainly a question is inside or outside activity, but the ordinance is fairly clear that indicates that inside activity is still not allowed to be done beyond the building. So, That makes sense. Yeah, I also like the notice to abutters. Um, yeah, they do that as probably all of you realize for you know planning board, zoning board sorts of matters. So this is not a new municipal. But those standards. Concept. It's quite a liberal capture. I think it's within 500 feet. I don't think that might be a bit extreme for this. Um, maybe uh, well. Bailey's is not is maybe the exception to the rule. Most of the other ones are within maybe 100 feet because they're lower keys, much smaller operations. That seems a bit onerous to have. But we'll consider and come forward with a proposal as to so, what yeah, is the reason. If you would take up and and bring back to us a proposal on notice to abutters on um, editing the application form to include. Uh, procurement of information about any nuisance, primarily, I think, noise. Uh, of, uh, I, I suppose it could be traffic mm -hmm. uh, or parking, but... Uh, uh, well, this is limited to the special amusement application, so I really think it's the expected noise is coming from a very specific set mm -hmm. of activities, not in general business uh, noise. So, so if, if <coughs> I think we all comfortable kind of with getting recommendations on that. Uh, once that information is submitted, we now need to be able to have a process so that we as town councilors aren't presented with this blind, you know, application. We need to have, uh, and I guess my suggestion is that uh, either the town clerk or the assistant town manager or the town manager or a combination uh, would actually uh, establish what those conditions might be. So could I suggest that it might also be part of the application process where they either agree to abide by the good neighbor ordinance or um, they're requesting a, a an exemption under certain conditions and they could define what those conditions are and then that would be presented to the to the town council for consideration. So we're, like the, that yes. was one question That's I had was point. daytime hours. Is that dawn to dusk? Is that? It's defined in the ordinances um, yeah. until 10 o'clock yeah. on um, oh, okay. Friday. Okay. Yeah. Daytime hours is defined as going until 10 o'clock on Friday and Saturday. On Friday and Saturday at 9, 9 o'clock on the other right. day. So and, well, and that might be something to collect the on the actual application even, though, isn't having them, because if they write it on their application, they're committing to this is when we intend to do these. Yeah, the time of day. Right. It would be helpful to know. Some places may, uh, we're going to have a music on Friday say, nights only. Right. You know, yeah. if it's so seven days, days it's different than one. Private <laughs> activity, is it acoustic versus, no. you know, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think it's worth highlighting the, the 200 feet from the source of noise so during the day and the inside the building only. Uh, or no, maybe the 200 feet is the is the parameter that we use for notice to the abutters. Yeah. yeah. That has some basis in logic, right? Okay. And we could require that that notice uh, contain certain information, like the date that the application will be heard by the council. So people are aware that application is pending and if they wish to provide comment, and the, here's when. And, and yep. that here's the, uh, if you choose not to uh, present yourself, here's how you can communicate with all seven town councils. Yeah. Can I bring up one point though? A little uh, anonymity never hmm. hurts to get some honesty of. Um, do, so I, um, 
the wording of this is concerning me. I understand that uh, the town attorney looked at it, but um, during daytime hours, which is audible a minimum of 200 feet from the source of the noise, except as otherwise permitted, licensed, or sponsored by the town. Um, and this is not considered a permit, this special amusement. It is. It is a permit. It is a permit. So but we determined that this is not. So uh, we would, for instance, we might issue an amusement permit for a fireworks display at the speedway. And that noise is clearly going to go outside. And so I think that I implicit in the issuing the permit is they're telling you what we're doing. And so they're saying you're not going to be uh, subject to that 200 foot. I see. So it would be a, a special exemption to the special amusement permit. Yeah. If you have, you'd have to have it very clearly stated what uh, what the uh, conditions are that would allow you to go beyond the yep. uh, noise ordinance. So it seems like clarifying the application is really the... the I think so. A good approach. Uh, and clarifying it that in a way that says, and because I think all seven town councilors are going to want to weigh in on this, that uh, the noise ordinance is applicable. Yeah. That, that to me is an important issue that uh, uh, you could have gotten half the town council saying, well, I've always assumed it wasn't applicable. Others say, oh, no, I've always thought it was. So I don't think we'd have had one mind. Well, good. I, I think that's... Uh, Start. Good place to start. Thank you. Good. So we'll come back to you at the next meeting with some uh, proposed changes to the application itself. Good. Yeah, that would that would be very good. And we'll we'll work in the next month to to shape that up, and then we'll circulate it in advance so that people have a chance to think about it. Um, the next item on the agenda is a discussion on snow removal from sidewalks. Councillor Rowan uh, uh, brought this up, and I'm going to uh, ask you to introduce it. Certainly. And I just brought it up from the uh, interest of just having a discussion about it. Um, I have observed um, specifically, I mean, I've, I'm sure the behavior is, is beyond my neighborhood, but in my neighborhood, um, rarely do uh, the individuals that have a sidewalk clear their sidewalk after, after there's snow. Um, and so the, the implication of that is that um, children, when they're walking to the bus stop, have to walk on the street um, um, when the snow banks are high. It's, uh, you know, I, I feel like it's potentially a source of, you know, they're now walking on the street, they're hard to see. Um, and I also have concerns around individuals with mobility concerns. Um, and so I, I, when I lived in Portland, there was an ordinance in Portland that says that if you own the property, you have to clear it within a certain period of time. Um, so I wanted to throw that out there and see what people thought. I know that there are differences between Portland and Scarborough that are um, you know, mar marked, um, but, um, but we also we don't have a lot of sidewalks necessarily. There are certain sections of the town where we do, but otherwise we don't. <laughs> oh, I have some good. I have a good story for this one. <laughs> when I was a little girl in Detroit, I built the biggest snow horse I've ever been able to build, and guess where it landed? Right in the middle of the sidewalk. <laughs> because I couldn't push it anymore. It was one of those, and we and we had to remove it for exactly the reasons you're saying. But it was because in the city that was part of the law was if you owned. So I don't know. In your case, is your road a private road or? It's a, it's a public it's road. Yeah. And we don't take care of those sidewalks there, like we do. Oh, I know we do here on Route 1. Yeah, we have a whole, uh, we've mapped out all of the sidewalks. We know what they exist. We've prioritized them, and essentially school routes that we've designated, and also the entirety of the Route 1 corridor. Uh, the town's taken on the responsibility to, to clear those. But that that's it. Yeah. And, and we have, a, I mean, there's, I would expect it would be a huge expense to take on the, the rest of the sidewalks in town. And Which is why a lot of yeah cities will go, go to something like what Portland's doing. Um, do we have a sense of how, well, yeah, I don't know what the, the impact would that be, because there's a lot of neighborhoods in Scarborough that don't have sidewalks. Well, I, and I would and say another, another complicating factor is that there are a lot of um, sections of the sidewalk where there 
maybe isn't a house right there. It's either a vacant lot or it's, you know, a, a gully um, or it's, you know, around the corner where a neighbor, you know, you wouldn't think that it qualifies as being necessarily in front of your house or it's communally owned in an association of mine. My neighborhood is a, uh, has a neighborhood association that has communal ownership of some of the lots mm -hmm. and then, but I, I cut you off and I apologize. You know, uh, when I when I thought about this, I, I had the, I had the question of is, is it hard to do? Uh, uh, in other words, does the uh, does the plowing of the streets push snow onto the sidewalks, which makes it a mountain of snow? Uh, and I, I had a question about uh, is the sidewalk system sufficiently contiguous so that uh, it one is sort of equitable. Every, everyone's got a hand in the cleaning. Uh, 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 or are we so suburban that we don't really have an interconnected sidewalk system? Uh, uh, so, and, and I worried that you're imposing a condition on people of different physical abilities. Uh, because while well, I might say, great, anything to exercise in the winter is fine. I love this new rule. Whereas my neighbor next door might be 80. And he goes, my wife says, don't even pick up that shovel. And so now I'm having to pay for that. Mm -hmm. So it's the variation of uh, situations that cause me concern. So those... Uh, so Go if ahead. I could, I, I, I want to ask the town manager. I'm sure he has some thoughts, and I want him to be able to weigh in on. So I can tell you because I because I do clear my section of the sidewalk. It's very hard to do, um, <laughs> <laughs> and I go all the way down to the to the fire hydrant, and the, like the 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 guy that plows the road that intersects it is a private private road. Piles it right in front of there. <laughs> Uh, so it's very hard to do, um, and no, it's definitely not contiguous, nor would it be equitable. Some people are going to have to do it, and some some wouldn't. So if you so. if you get to the end of a of a plowed sidewalk, and you want to get to the street, you may not actually be at a driveway that would afford you the ability to be climbing over a snow pile yep. to get back to the street, uh, which happens because a lot of sidewalks are not plowed. Therefore, kids are walking in the street, and, and I can see why you'd raise the question. Tom, you yeah, have a couple thoughts. Uh, you know, one of the complaints we've heard consistently at the planning board is, you know, the requirement to impose uh, to put sidewalks in certain subdivisions because they don't connect it to anywhere. Um, sometimes, even in the subdivision, they're sufficient enough for exercise purposes. Uh, Council Rowan mentions uh, bus stop locations, but there are other areas that um, it, it really begs the question: um, Why do we require them in the first place? Because they don't lead to anything per se. Uh, but I think it's a matter, it's also a matter of scale. It's very common in a more uh, densely populated uh, urban center. Portland, you might have 50 feet of frontage if you're lucky. In a suburban model, you might have two or 300 feet of frontage. Mm -hmm. And so that's a world of difference. Um, so I think there's some practical challenges. And I suspect it's not, it wouldn't be terribly popular um, just putting that out there. <laughs> Sometimes it's wise not to self-impose. Isn't that just covered in the good neighbor? Like, if you're a good neighbor, you clean your sidewalk? <laughs> oh, no, that's what I was thinking. We throw it, sneak it right in there, nobody will notice. Yeah. Well, what I try to do in my neighborhood is cutting grass at the end, and I can't even see the cul-de-sac at the end, but I try to model good behavior, so I go down and cut it, and my hope, hmm. I've been nine years doing this, that one of the neighbors that does look at it says, why? You know, I should go out and do that. It hasn't worked yet, but I'm, I'm trying to model good behavior. So, sometimes my neighbor does clear his guilt. Like, he's shamed him into doing it. Right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Tom's neighbors for nine years. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Sucker. Yeah, <laughs> things this year. Thank God. Don't ever move. Uh, but uh, just the other point, just an anecdote. I, uh, it amazes me that homeowners... Uh, don't take the time to shovel out the hydrant that's closest to them. It's only in their self-interest to make sure that the hydrant is ready and available if needed. Um. Yeah, I know. The um, fire department will usually put out some kind of public publicity mm -hmm. that uh, encourages people, there's no obligation, right. but encourages people in, that, in each neighborhood uh, 
uh, because there's one right next to my mailboxes. So. And, and we do go around. If they're not clear, we'll clear them. But um, ideally, we'd love homeowners to adopt a hydrant. <laughs> right, adopt a hydrant. Yep. Well, good. Okay. Uh, I think the um, the sense of the discussion is that there are some very difficult hurdles for that to ever uh, elevate itself to an action item for us, uh, but worthy of discussion. And where is that? Enforcement, uh, the difficulty of enforcement always enters into the equation of whether you're going to enact an ordinance. People do not like to have ordinances enacted where there's a low likelihood of enforcement. So. The good news is you could save a lot of money in your gym membership just to the whole. Yeah, yeah cool. keep going. Yeah. <laughs> keep going. All the Four hours. We'll take the day off. Pardon? Well, I was also just thinking. Yeah. yeah. Your, your I got my eye on a couple of the kids. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, identification of next agenda items. I think we have already identified uh, both items four and five will come back uh, and be, I think, an important discussion. We'll have, I think, a better understanding when four it comes back, the public parking lot passes uh, from the community services director as to what his plans are, and we can react to those. Uh, and we can go from there. Uh, and we'll have some uh, work on these special amusement permits. Anything else that... Uh, can I just inquire, on those two agenda items, uh, it strikes me, because of the nature of each of them, they're not immediately time sensitive. Um, mm -hmm. But I would ask, is it important to this committee to move one or both of these through while you still sit um, mm -hmm. as a yeah. committee? Yeah. It's, 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 it's true. Yeah. Our, our next meeting would routinely be the first week of October, and then the last meeting that we would hold uh, before a new yeah, council was November. seated would be the first. I think you'll have two more. So we'd have two more meetings. Thank you. I request that I'd like to um, update our Yes, certainly. Yeah. I, I, I say we try and bring them, bring, I mean, my, my sense would be let's push them forward. Push them forward, take it up in October. And yes. Yeah, I'm confident we can turn around the special movement one. Um, I, I just don't want to speak on Todd's behalf. I, I think yeah. he'll be in a position if to have would, remnants of a proposal. When, for you. when we get around to actually publishing the agenda uh, a week or so before, when Tracy starts to put it mm -hmm. together, uh, we'll, we'll look for guidance from you as okay. to where uh, Dot stands on it. It'll either be on or be off. Well, I think this will probably provide some motivation to move through that. I know he's been talking about it. I think it would probably be forward. a good idea to just keep pushing uh, so that uh, it's an orderly process and he, he'll be ready in the spring. Good. Uh, any, do you have Larissa's suggestion for a third item? Anything else? Good. Nope. Okay. That will be a, probably a pretty full agenda. Uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Thank you. <laughs> so, Tom, so when I last went to Irish American Chicago, and Tom expressed shock when I was thinking about not knowing where my fire hydrant was, I was going to fire